Hi all, welcome. I'm Danielle McCartney and today we're going to talk about strain theories and how they explain white collar crime. Strain theories argue that strain creates pressures and incentives to engage in criminal behavior. First up, Anomie by Robert Merton. Merton said that it was really the rigid adherence to conventional American values, in particular the drive for economic and material wealth, that causes high rates of crime and deviance. And this pressure creates an incentive for us to engage in criminal behavior. Our culture gives us particular goals, things that we want to achieve, things that are considered good and useful or successful. We can accept those goals or we can choose to reject those goals. But you know, there's more than one way to achieve a goal. So Merton said that there were several institutionalized means, like approved ways to accomplish a particular goal. So mostly that means like going to school, getting a good job. These are things that are approved ways of accomplishing that goal of economic success. We can accept that those are the ways that we're supposed to accomplish those goals, or we can reject them and do something totally different. Merton laid out several ways to respond to the pressure to achieve particular goals using particular means. The first is conformity. This is the dominant mode of adaptation. Most of us accept the goals that our society sets for us and we do them in the approved way. We accomplish them the way that we're supposed to. But what if we don't? What if we respond in some other ways? So say we accept the goal of economic success, but for whatever reason, we can't use institutionalized means. So maybe we don't have access to college education. We don't know how to navigate the college institution. We don't know where to find a good job. Merton talked about these as blocked opportunity structures. Then we might do something outright criminal. This is called the innovator. This is the approach when we are getting creative with how we accomplish those goals, but we're doing them in ways that are not approved by society. This is where white collar criminals live. So even if they're prosperous, if they're already successful, maybe the cultural goal is so pervasive, the need for economic success is so pervasive that they engage in these innovator behaviors, embezzlement, fraud, all of these techniques that are not approved, but that still accomplish the goal of economic success. Next up are ritualists. So have you ever met someone who was almost compulsively adhered to the rules, even if they didn't get anything out of it? Well, they might've been a ritualist. So for ritualists, that's when we've given up on achieving the goals, but we still follow the rules. So maybe we just don't have any opportunity for success. We try and we try and we're not achieving economic success. Well, we might focus on following the rules, come what may, like, workers in a bureaucracy where they will never advance. So they pile on the red tape on every transaction. This adaptation isn't a great fit in white collar crime. Some have described companies that violate the law repeatedly and pay fines because the fines are the cost of doing business as ritualists. But the corporations are still striving for, for prosperity. So yeah. The adaptation of retreatism, Merton said, is when we've given up entirely and we withdraw from society. So this really represents drug addicts and hermits, for example. We don't accept the goals that society has set for us to be economically prosperous, and we don't wanna follow the rules to get there. So again, in terms of white collar crime, this is a bit of a stretch. If we withdraw from the world, we probably are not motivated to engage in white collar crime. But this could refer to workers who show up for work, but don't do any work. Not a crime, but pretty crappy. So there's one more adaptation. Uh, what if like the retreatists, we reject the goals of society and we reject the means that we're supposed to use to get there, but we're still productive. So one way we might do this is by creating whole new goals and by creating whole new means. This would make us rebels. These are outside the whole system. So we not only reject cultural goals, and how we're supposed to achieve them, but we propose a whole new structure. So political revolutions, religious cults, and communes would be an example of this. 
In the world of white collar crime, again, a, not a great fit. So it's not necessarily illegal, but Kitty Calavita and her co-authors described collective embezzlement as a crime committed by the organization against the organization. So rather than focusing on success as the goal, workers developed failure as the goal so that government insurance programs would bail out failed businesses. Messner and Rosenfeld extended strain theory by pointing out that if a society is primarily shaped by economic interests, then economic logic permeates other social institutions and other areas, such as education. So this really results in utilitarian behavior on the part of members of society and a decline in social control and therefore an increase in crime. What was missing from anomie theory, they argue, is an understanding of how the American dream promotes and sustains an institutional structure in which one institution, the economy, assumes dominance over all others. So this apparent imbalance in the institutional structure limits the ability of other social institutions, such as the family, education, or the political system to insulate members of society from the criminogenic pressures of the American dream or to impose controls over their behavior. So for example, Messner and Rosenfeld contend that education is primarily a means to a better job. So it's valued only insofar as it promises economic rewards. To summarize, Messner and Rosenfeld's institutional anime theory holds that culturally produced pressures to secure monetary rewards coupled with weak controls from non-economic social institutions promote high rates of criminal activity. So to the extent that social institutions are subservient to the economic structure, they fail to provide alternative definitions of self-worth and achievement that could serve as countervailing forces against the economic pressures of the American dream. Next up, general strain theory. Robert Agnew's general strain theory argues that strain leads to negative emotions, which may lead to a number of outcomes, including delinquency. Any of the following can result in all kinds of crime, including white collar crimes like financial crimes, occupational abuse, and various kinds of misconduct. Rather than defining strain as the difference between our financial goals and our legitimate means to achieve those goals like Merton, Agnew stated that strain was caused by the difference between our aspirations towards any goal and the means to achieve that goal. According to Agnew, strain includes the failure to achieve positively valued goals like money, status, or respect, and autonomy. The removal of positively valued stimuli, such as the loss of a valued possession, not getting a promotion, or going through a breakup and the presentation of negatively valued stimuli, such as physical abuse, harassment at work, homelessness. In the white collar world, this could include corporations that violate regulations in order to escape from an adverse economic situation. But all of us feel strains like this and we don't embezzle from our companies. Agnew claimed that certain kinds of strains are more likely to lead to crime and deviance. First, strains that are perceived as unjust. Strains perceived to be unjust are likely to result in crime as they tend to result in anger. Anger, according to Agnew, is the negative affective state most conducive to criminal behavior because anger inhibits our ability to think rationally, often causing us to overlook alternative, rational, or peaceful means to resolve issues. Strains that are perceived as high in magnitude or intensity, that is, they're a big deal. The negative emotions generated by high magnitude strains are more difficult to cope with or to ignore or to deal with by legitimate behavioral means. Strains that create some incentive to engage in criminal coping. Agnew argued that certain subcultures react to strain in particular ways. So for example, in the Enron scandal, the culture at Enron encouraged traders to engage in shady schemes and even rewarded them for doing so. And then strains that are associated with low social control. Strains that are related to low social control, such as overly permissive parenting, increase the likelihood of crime because they decrease our attachment to society. So if we perceive we have relatively little to risk by engaging in crime, we're more likely to do it. On the other hand, if we have high stakes in pro-social institutions, such as strong family relationships or good working relationships, 
we're less likely to choose criminal behavior as a source of coping because we fear losing the institutions or persons to which we are attached. Next up, relative deprivation theory. Relative deprivation theory focuses not on an absolute lack, but on our perception of our well-being relative to comparison others. So our perceptions of our objective conditions can be really distorted. When we compare ourselves to others, we can easily believe some others have it better than us, particularly when we're looking at someone's social media highlight reel. We may feel deprived when we lack something, perceive that similar others have it, we want it, and we feel entitled to have it. Some theorists argue that we must also think it's feasible to get it and that we lack a sense of responsibility for failure to possess that thing. Relative deprivation results in feelings of despair, frustration, grievance, anger, and may be a powerful motivator for crime. Thanks for joining me. Hope you learned a lot. I'll see you next time.